Let's sing to him. Oh, come on, you faithful. Oh, come on, ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and be talks about the goodness of our Lord. Oh, we worship you. Help me sing. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. Oh, my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, Till I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God And all my life You have been faithful And all my life You have been so the goodness of God. Oh, I love, I love your voice. Come on. You have led me through the fire and in darkest night. You are close like no one. Oh, I've known, I've known you as a father. I've known you as 
can lift up our worship to you, Father God, and just say that you have been so good, that in this holiday season that we get to celebrate with friends and family, though it may look different for some of us, God, we still thank you for your goodness, that you sent your son to give us freedom. God, you sent a gift for us this holiday as well, and we just thank you that we can reflect, God, on how faithful and how good you have been, even in the most difficult seasons, and that even even in the most difficult moments, Father God. And if for some of us it's a little bit hard to be able to see your goodness in the season that we're in. Father, I just pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, open our minds, God, to see you moving and working, even when it's difficult. Father, and that we would just continue to praise you and continue to worship you and continue to lift up our voices to you and declare that you have been so, so faithful all of our lives, all of our days. So we thank you for this morning of worship. Would you continue to move in our hearts as we continue to worship through our giving, through our speaking, as we come together as a community, Father God, to be one with you. So we thank you for this morning. Would you continue just to move in your holy name? We pray all things. Amen. It was not a silent night. There was blood on the ground You could hear a woman cry In the alleyways that night On the streets of David's town And the stable was not clean 
the cobblestones were cold Little Mary full of grace With the tears upon her face Had no mother's hands to hold There was a labor of pain It was a cold sky Noble Joseph by her side Calloused hands and weary eyes There were no midwives to be found On the streets of David's town In the middle of the night So he held her and he Shafts of moonlight on his face For the baby in her womb He was the maker of the moon He was the author of our faith That can make the mountains move It was a lady labor of love It was a labor of pain It was a cold sky above But for the girl on the ground in the dark With every beat of her beautiful heart It was a labor Little Mary full of grace With the tears upon her face It was a labor of Well, from the elders and our staff, and in fact, all of our Eastside congregation that gathers together, we want to say to you who are watching us today, Merry Christmas. We're so glad you've taken the time to be with us this Sunday before Christmas as we celebrate the coming of the Lord Jesus. Now, today, the subject is three simple words back to back with an exclamation point at the end. Our subject is, Jesus is born, exclamation point, Jesus is born. What do you say, let's revisit Matthew's gospel, where we've spent a lot of time in the last half of 2020, and turn to the very first chapter, Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18, and let's look at God's word together. Here it is. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. 
Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. And he, that is Joseph, gave him the name Jesus. Here in Matthew chapter 1, we find 31 verses that he tells us concerning the Christmas story. Now, in these 31 verses, and we've looked at about seven of them, in these 31 verses, there is no mention by Matthew of the miraculous conception, as in other accounts of the gospel. There is no mention of the, the angel Gabriel visiting, announcing, and comforting Mary with the news that she would carry Jesus' to birth. What we really have in Matthew chapter 1 is, is, if you will, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the personality of Matthew the tax collector or Matthew the accountant coming through. It's almost he is writing, if you will, as the old Dragnet series and Joe Friday used to say, the detective, he's writing about just the facts. In fact, you see that there in verse 18 where he starts out the narrative by saying, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. <laughs> and then he just outlines the facts. He just provides us the, the bottom line. Now, in today's language of our culture, you might have heard of three letters, DTR. Maybe you put that in some type of memo or you put it in a text message. When you're talking about two people that know each other or you're making commentary observation, you put down the letters DTR. And what does that mean? That means to define the relationship. And I think it'd be really important for us because we have Western minds that are watching this and looking at this passage, most of us at least grew up in the West, and we have modern thinking in our minds and all that's normal, I think it might be good for us to, if you will, to take this moment early in our study to DTR, to define the relationship between Joseph and Mary, Mary and Joseph in Matthew chapter 1. It's interesting, if you step back into the text at verse 18, the Bible says, Matthew comments and says that Mary was pledged, pledged to Joseph. That's a word you might hear if you're in a fraternity or a sorority in college, that you pledge to be a part of an organization and you become a pledge, you wear a pledge pen. Well, the word used here is the word pledged. It says that Mary was pledged, leaned in to make a commitment to Joseph. Then in verse 19, like that, we find that Joseph is considering a divorce. The news of Jesus, uh, the baby being within her was obvious concern and mystery and frustration to him. But it says that he was considering a divorce. So it'd be good for us to define the relationship as they are man and woman, young person to young person. Why would he divorce someone he was pledged to that he was not yet married to? Well, in Jewish culture of the ancient days of Jesus, you discover that there are three stages or three 
progressions in marriage. Let's take a look at them. Three progressions of first century marriage. And as we unpack these, we unpack the relationship. We define the relationship that's so important. We need to understand it. The first stage or the progression in marriage, in Jewish life in Jesus' day, was engagement. And that's a word we're very comfortable with. We know what it means to when someone, our couple, gets engaged. In Jesus' day, his parents' day, what that meant was that there was usually a very young couple who knew each other and liked each other, a boy, a girl, a teenager to teenager, and they liked each other very, very much, and the parents approved of their liking each other. And over time, it kind of was understood or arranged that they would get married. And so this engagement, sometimes if there was a child who did not know another child or another family, the parents did not know another family where there could be this kind of arrangement, sometimes there was a matchmaker involved. And that matchmaker would make the connection. What, what, what would happen is, though, there would be an, a, an arranged marriage that would, would be on the horizon. It, it was going to be out there. You knew these two people were going to be together. And these parents of these two children took this engagement very, very seriously. That's stage number one. Now, the second stage in the progression of marriage in the time of Jesus is betrothal, betrothal. Uh, this would be, if you will, when the engagement became public or it became official, that this couple where there was an arrangement between the families, they were now making public that this couple would become husband and wife. It wasn't marriage engagements like today, but things went to a whole new level at engagement then just like it does now. And in Jewish culture, it became more serious from the standpoint of legal definition. It was just more grave, more serious, more sobering. And the only way that you could break a betrothal was with a divorce. Now, in our Western minds, we think you can break, in a, break up in an engagement and you don't need a lawyer. That's just simply a, a guy and a girl just breaking it off. But not in this case. In the days of Jesus, this betrothal phase, phase number two, was very, very serious. And if it was broken off, if the betrothal was broken off, the groom had to make a financial settlement with the, the bride-to-be's family. And this was all part of getting the divorce. Now, the third progression is very obvious, and we all know it, and that third progression, that third stage is marriage. It's just simply marriage. The bride and groom, there is a public ceremony. They exchange vows and other cultural and spiritual elements, and they become husband and wife. And usually in the day of Jesus, the the bride would move into a house that was owned by the groom. Now back to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 and verse 19. Matthew chapter 1, where Joseph is beginning to get news about what has happened with Mary, and she's pledged to him, he's pledged to her, but he discovers she's pregnant. He begins to pursue a divorce. This pledging that you read about here in verse 18 happens in phase two of the charting that I provided just moments ago. It happened during the betrothal phase. Joseph and Mary were pre-married, if you will. Uh, they had made a public and legal commitment to each other. It was a serious deal. So when you read that 
Joseph's response in verse 19 was that he was going to divorce her out of this and, and stop this betrothal relationship before there was a public marriage ceremony. Joseph was carrying a, a heavy, heavy load because Joseph had, had, had assumed when he found out that Mary was, was pregnant, he had assumed that she had been intimate with another man. And that can be heart-wrenching. You can try to put yourself into Joseph's mind or his shoes and try to feel his emotions. And so what he does is he quietly, in a very dignified way, in some ways to protect him and save face, but also he loved Mary. He began to put in motion in his mind that he needed to divorce her. Now, here's what we don't know. We don't know about the conversation when Mary told Joseph she was with child. Put yourself there in Mary's position or Joseph's position if you can. They're young. And she delivers this news to him and it's jaw-dropping, it's gobsmacking, it's stunning. We don't know how she presented it. We don't exactly know how all that was transpired. But what we do know by the grace of God, that by the time we get to verse 20 and verse 21, that God steps in and communicates a message to Joseph that begins to put the pieces back together for him not to walk away or divorce his betrothed fiance. Look at verse 20. But after he had considered this, that is divorce, the angel of the Lord that is the messenger of the Lord, appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Wow. Verse 21, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. So that's setting the stage. Now, what do you say? Let's take the remaining minutes in this passage and let's talk about the baby. We've defined the relationship between Mary and Joseph. That's important because this would be the couple that would raise the Lord Jesus. No couple had ever experienced such news. No couple since then has ever experienced such news. Jesus is so unique. But now Jesus is as an embryo, as, as, as a, a fetus, as a baby, is within the womb of young Mary. It's important for us now, since we've defined the relationship, that we more purposefully define the Savior. Verse 20 says that the angel communicates to Joseph that there is no human father. Jesus will be fathered by the Holy Spirit. And then as the text moves on, we see obviously that Jesus will be born out of the body of a woman named Mary. So you have this half here and this half here. And so you might conclude to yourself, well, that means that Jesus is 50% human and Jesus is 50% divine that would be making up the 100% of the Jesus who would be born. But you would be wrong in that calculation because the Lord Jesus himself was 100% God and he was 100% man. There has never been, there will never be 
anyone like Jesus. He was and is the God-man. 100% God, 100% man. You see, this is the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the most unique birth. He is the most unique person who has ever lived in this world. Now, take a moment with me and consider his, his nature. Let's spend a little time here and let's just talk about his nature. Jesus, in his nature, in his makeup, in his fabric, in his essence, in his being, Jesus, in his nature, was virgin born. Now, if you ever follow the thinking of a theological liberal, you will find that soon in their attack on the Lord Jesus Christ are their raising questions about the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find that it usually begins right here with the virgin birth. That's where they will drive down a stake and try to, to dismantle the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Bible tells us that Jesus was born from a virgin, her name Mary. You see, if, 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 if you dismantle the virgin birth, and don't miss this, please. If you dismantle the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus, you begin to dismantle what Jesus came to this earth to do. And it's important we teach this, the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus. This is a key foundational principle, theological tenet in our church and in our Christian school. We believe in the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus. It's foundational. And one of the reasons it's so important to teach the virgin birth and remind concerning the virgin birth and its foundational truth is because many in our country are fading away from believing that as we become increasingly secular. For instance, just, just seven years ago, 74% of the American population believed in the virgin birth. That's 74%. Fast forward to today, that number is now down to 64%. That is a 10% drop in 10 years. As we increasingly see the, the lessening of the Christian faith influence in our culture, we see less and less understanding or embracing of the virgin birth. I want you to understand if you are a guest and you are looking for a church home in 2021, as we hope COVID regulations decrease, I want to encourage you to come to Eastside. I want to encourage you to come to a church that believes the Bible from cover to cover, believes that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. We believe that Jesus was virgin born, that Jesus was fathered by the Holy Spirit, and mothered by Mary, the Virgin Mary, never known a man. We believe these things. We believe the Bible. And I would encourage you to come and grow with us in the Word of God in 2021. It's really quite clear. If you look in the Scriptures, Matthew here, <clears throat> chapter 1 is very, very clear. Mary was a virgin, and the Holy Spirit fathered conceived within her what would become Jesus. That's Matthew's account. We could turn a few pages over to Luke's account, and we would find there that the Holy Spirit came on Mary, and the one who, who would be born would be called the Son of God. We can look way back at Isaiah's account. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, which, by the way, is quoted here in verse 23 of Matthew 1. Math, Isaiah 7, 14 says, The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. I'm telling you, the virgin birth is an essential, fundamental tenet of our faith. Let me amplify that just a little bit more. You need to always remember 
the birth of Jesus is always connected to the death of Jesus, Christmas has a direct connection on Easter. Jesus Christ was conceived like no other baby. Jesus Christ, if he had not been conceived the way he was, Jesus Christ could not be God. Jesus Christ, 100% God. Simultaneously, Jesus Christ, 100% man. Now, what I'd like to do for the next few minutes is to simply take the revelation from the Word of God, starting in Genesis, and give you four or five verses that demonstrates how important it was that God become man and that that man be sinless, that he be born of a virgin as a child, that he would live a sinless life, and that he would die on the cross and become sin for us. And, and it is so dramatic, and it is so important. It is, it is essential for me to say, you can never save yourself. I can never save myself. We can never forgive ourselves of our sins. We're not qualified to do that. We're not eligible to do that. We're not candidates. We're not even close to doing it. We can't work our way to heaven. No, 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 no way. It all begins with the issue of sin, going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Let me, let me share with you, and you can look on the screen, some verses that help us understand the sin problem and the answer to sin in Jesus Christ. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to verse 17, look at the scriptures. It says that the Lord took the man, that's Adam, and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now, the kind of death he's speaking of, see it there, it says die. The kind of death he's speaking of here is a spiritual death. Physical death, that's not what this means, because... Adam would live a long time, hundreds of years after this happened. Both Adam and Eve would live. But when they partook of the fruit from the tree that God had said, do not partake of, that is when sin entered the human race. That is the fall, the fall of man, the fall of woman. And sin entered us and everything changed from that innocence in the garden. Paul in the New Testament gives some context to it in just a few verses. In Ephesians 4, verse 18 and 19, he says, they are darkened. That would be individuals in sin before Jesus in our sin condition. We, they are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they are given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they are full of greed. That is sin, and this is what sinners do. We are all messed up on the inside, and Paul provides in Ephesians chapter 4 profile of what it is like to be born in sin. Now stay with me on this. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 15, pardon me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul goes on to say that in Adam's sin, I die. In Adam, when I'm born in sin, I, I die. I, I will eventually die a physical death, but I, I'm dead spiritually when I am in Adam. Adam. Fascinating study that Paul makes, by the way, in Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8 about what it means to be in Adam and then being transitioned by salvation to being in Christ. But look at Romans chapter, uh, let me go, uh, let, me, let, me, let me look at 1 Corinthians, pardon me, 15 verse 22. It says here, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, here's pay dirt. 
Here's the reality. It says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. We, when we are born in this world, you and I, we are born spiritually dead. We are born in sin. Paul says we're born in Adam. We identify in Adam And there is no way we can possibly save ourselves. The wages of sin is death. And then, with all that has happened, a world that is filled with sin, in the first century, God in his grace and love and sovereignty sends Jesus Christ. He sends Jesus Christ. He sends the baby Jesus. And the baby Jesus is born with no sin. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, God is his father, God with no sin. The container is the body, the reproductive parts of a girl named Mary who had never known physical intimacy with a man to that point. And Jesus is born, exclamation point. Jesus grows up as a boy, becomes a young man, and then a a man in his early 30s and has a public ministry. And Jesus lives... As the God-man, 100% God, 100% man, he came and lived among people just like you and me of that day, and he lives a sinless life in a human body. He lives a sinless life as a human being. And then the Bible tells us that that same Jesus who was born of the virgin That same Jesus who was conceived, fathered by the Holy Spirit. That that same Jesus who lived a sinless life at approximately 33 and a half years of age, Jesus Christ goes on the cross and he dies for our sin. And here's what happened in that process. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, when he went to the cross, Paul writes concerning Jesus, God made him, that is Jesus, God made him who had no sin to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. I'm talking about his nature 100% God, 100% man. The virgin birth matters, beloved. If not for the virgin birth, his dying on the cross would make Jesus just another religious martyr. The one big difference in how he died is how he was born. That's the big difference. The big, big difference in how he died is how he was born. He was born of a virgin, born without sin, and on the cross became sin for you and me that we might receive the gift of eternal life. We have eternal life because of his nature, the virgin-born, sinless Savior. Last thought. Not only in Matthew chapter 1 are are we introduced to his nature, virgin-born, but we're also introduced to his name. Would you with me consider his name? I don't know if you know this or not, but in one particular Bible concordance that I study, 
there are 198 names for Jesus Christ, just two short of 200. 198 names in the Bible that are names for Jesus Christ. Uh, on your screen, you're going to see a, a couple of dozen that are there. And then if you look at them, you'll see things like Alpha, Omega. He is the amen, the beginning, the end, the bread of life. Toward the end of that listing of some two dozen, he is, his name is Lord. He's called the living stone. He's called Rabbi. He is called the rock. 198 names. But here's what is so magnetic and attractive as a Bible student. When I think about how the Holy Spirit used Matthew strategically to provide for us introductory names. And there are two of them. There are two names for introduction of Jesus to us. The first name is the name Emmanuel. It's there in verse 23, Emmanuel. The other name is the word Jesus. Before we're done, let's stop in this neighborhood and check out these verses. Emmanuel in verse 23 tells us who he is. Who is he? God with us. God with us. You know, it's common in our, our, our language, is it not, to say things like, well, you know, God bless us, or um, God help us, God save us, God keep us, God use us. But here it says, God with us. Or more slavishly literal in the Greek, with us God. I want to say this is a word of encouragement to every Christ follower who is watching today. In the midst of difficult times, no matter what it is that you are facing, Jesus Christ is with you. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, he is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. And it is the Holy Spirit that lives within you, the same Holy Spirit that fathered the Lord Jesus in Mary's womb is the same Holy Spirit that lives within you to, to be with you, to comfort you, and to guide you. I tell you, Christ follower, he will not forsake you. Matthew uses the name Emmanuel to introduce you to Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. And then in verse 21 and verse 25, he says, Joseph, you're going to call his name Jesus. Manuel tells us who he is, but Jesus tells us what he will do. And what is it that Jesus is going to do? Well, according to verse 21, Jesus is going to save his people from their sin. Jesus means Savior. Yeshua, Hebrew Joshua, Jehovah is salvation. That's Jesus. Now, I want to end this with just a reminder to you, and I, this is so powerful, his nature and his, and his name. We must never separate who he is from what he does. Can't separate. Never separate who he is. Who is he? He is the virgin born, sinless son of God. And what does he do? He goes to the cross and he dies for your sins and mine. Never separate who he is and what he does. Never separate his nature and his name. His ability to do what he does comes from who he is. If you drive a wedge between who he is and what he does, you destroy the validity and the authenticity of what he does on the cross for your sins. You see, the virgin birth is a big, big deal in the Christmas story. That's his nature, which makes his name 
Emmanuel, God with us, not only physically and spiritually meaningful, but it also is a reminder of his name Jesus and what he does to forgive us of our sins. This is an awesome passage of scripture. Jesus Christ is born, exclamation point. Let's pray. Father, today we rejoice in the story of Jesus. May we remember what Jesus did, not just there in the manger coming the world, but what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. Thank you for Jesus coming who would cleanse us of our sins when we simply repent and ask him to do so. Thank you, Father, that Jesus was born. In his name I pray, amen.